Disc 39, Snuff By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 21x24 My wife will enjoy the fresh air, and young Sam will just love the, just love the elephants, oh, won't he just? The lieutenant brightened up. May I suggest, then, that after dinner you take the overnight boat? It will be the black-eyed Susan, quite speedy, like her namesake, according to popular legend. She's due to go upriver in, let me see, three quarters of an hour. She's very fast, doesn't take much in the way of cargo so they gear her up high. You'll be home in the morning, how about that? Just time to get yourself smartened up, and if you like the idea then I will get one of the men to go and find the Susan's captain and make certain she doesn't leave without you. Vims smiled. What's the weather forecast? Clear skies, Commander, and old treachery is as flat as a mill pond, scoured of every snag and boulder for the rest of the season. It's plain sailing from now on. Good evening, Your Grace. The voice was somewhat familiar and Vims saw, sauntering down the boulevard, what at first seemed like a man wearing a huge cummerbund until further swift forensic inspection showed that it was the hermit from the hall. His beard was remarkably clean and wrapped around his body, as were two young ladies of the giggling persuasion. Vims peered at him. Stump! What are you doing down here? This caused further giggling. I'm on holiday, Commander. Yes, indeed. Every man should have a holiday, sir. Vims didn't know what to say and so patted the man on the shoulder and said, Knock yourself out, Mr. Stump, and don't forget the nourishing herbs. I think I'm going to need them, Commander, say what you like, the food in the Quorum Watch House canteen was pretty damn good, even if they did use a shade too much Avec, thought Vims, Avec on everything. Vims, well fed and cleaned up and with some very important paperwork stuffed down the inside of his freshly laundered and immaculately ironed shirt walked with Chief Constable Upshot down the quayside towards the black-eyed Susan. The lieutenant and two of the guards accompanied him to his cabin, where the dwarf butler demonstrated to him the cleanliness of the bed and the crispness of the sheets. Honored to have you sleeping in them, Commander. You will find that the Susan gives a very smooth ride, although she can sometimes bounce around a little, very much like her namesake, but least said, soonest mended. And, of course, there is a berth next door for Officer Feeney. You gentlemen might like to see the Susan get underway, perhaps. They did. The Susan had two oxen, just like the wonderful Fanny, but with no heavy cargo and only about ten passengers she was the express of old treachery. Her paddle wheels, highly geared indeed, left a line of white water all down the valley behind her. What happens now, Commander, said Feeney, leaning on the rail as they watched Quorum disappearing in the wake behind them. I mean, what are we going to do next? Vims was smoking a cigar with great pleasure. Somehow this seemed the time and the place. Snuff was all very well, but a good cigar had time and wisdom and personality. He would be unhappy to see this one go. I don't need to do anything now he said, turning to look at the sunset. And I don't often see sunsets these days either, he thought. Mostly I see midnights, and I don't need to chase Stratford, either. I know him like I know myself. He mentally paused, momentarily shocked at the implication. Aloud he continued, You saw those two Quormian officers get on the boat, didn't you? I arranged that. They will, of course, make certain that we have an undisturbed voyage. The crew have also been told that there may be some attempt by a murderer to board the boat. According to the lieutenant, Captain Harbinger can vouch for all of his crew as having sailed with him loyally for many years. Personally, of course, I'll make certain the door to my berth is locked, and I'd suggest you do the same thing, Feeney. Greed is at the center of this 
greed and hellish poisons. They're both killers and greed is the worst, by a long way. You know, usually when I'm talking to young officers such as yourself I say that in a certain type of case, you should always follow the money, you should ask, who stands to lose? Who stands to gain? Vims regretfully tossed the butt of his cigar into the water. But sometimes you should follow the arrogance. You should look for those who can't believe that the law would ever catch them, who believe that they act out of a right that the rest of us do not have. The job of the officer of the law is to let them know that they are wrong. The sun was setting. I do believe, Commander Vims, that you have something in you that would turn the wheels of this boat all by itself if a man could but harness it, said Feeney admiringly. And I remember reading somewhere that you would arrest the gods for doing it wrong. Vims shook his head. I'm sure I never said anything of the sort. But law is order and order is law and it must be the highest thing. The world runs on it, the heavens run on it and without order, lad, one second cannot follow another. He could feel himself swaying. Lack of sleep can poison the mind, drive it in strange directions. Vims felt Feeney's hand on his shoulder. I'll help you along to your cabin, Commander. It's been a very long day. Vims didn't remember getting undressed and into bed, or rather into bunk, but he clearly had done so and, according to the little bits of white foam on the cabin's tiny wash basin, he had cleaned his teeth as well. He had slept the sleep of the dead except for the bit where bits fall off and you crumble into dust and all he could recall was cool blackness and, rising now to the surface, a certainty, as if a message had been left in the blackness to await the return of thought. He is after you, blackboard monitor Vims. You know this because you recognize what was in his eyes. You know that type. They want to die from the day they are born, but something twists and so they kill instead. He will find you, and so will I. I hope the three of us meet in darkness. As the message drained away Vim stared at the opposite wall, in which the door now opened, after a cursory knock, to reveal the steward bearing that which is guaranteed to frighten away all nightmares, to wit, a cup of hot tea. Thirty no need to get up, Commander, came the cheerful greeting of the steward as he carefully placed the cup of tea in a little indentation that some foresight person had designed into the tiny cabin so that said teacup would not slide around. The captain would like to inform you that we'll be docking in about twenty minutes, although of course you'll be welcome to stay aboard and finish your breakfast while we clean the scuppers and take on fresh oxen and, of course, pick up mail and fodder and a few more passengers. In the galley, I have today and here the steward enthusiastically rattled off a menu of belly-stuffing proportions, concluding triumphantly with a bacon sandwich. Vims cleared his throat and said gloomily, I don't suppose you have any muesli, do you? After all, Sybil was only twenty minutes away. The steward looked puzzled. Well, yes, we would have the ingredients, of course, but I didn't peg you as a rabbit food man. Vims thought about Sybil again. Well, perhaps today my little nose is twitching. Luxurious though the cabin was, roomy it was not. Vims managed to shave with a razor donated by the steward, with the compliments of the captain, commander, and a thoughtfully placed basin, soap, flannel and minute towel, which at least helped him to deal with the form of ablution his old mother had called washing the bits that showed. He paid attention to them, nevertheless, taking some pains in the knowledge that this little wooden world would evaporate very soon and he would be back in the world of Sam Vim's husband and father. Periodically, however, as he made himself respectable, he turned back to himself in the shaving mirror and said, Fred Colon. The luxury cabin had turned out to be wonderful to sleep in, although so small that in reality it would only be suitable for a fastidious corpse. But eventually, when every part of Vim's he could reach had been decently, if erratically, 
scrubbed and the steward had brought him a hermit-sized portion of fruits and nuts and grains, he looked around to see what he might have left behind and saw a face in the shaving mirror. It was his own, although it must be said the phenomenon is not unusual in shaving mirrors. The vims in the mirror said, you know he doesn't just want to kill you. That wouldn't be good enough for a bastard like that, not by a long way. He wants to destroy you and will try everything until he does. I know, said Vims, and added, you're not a demon, are you? Absolutely not, said his mirror image. I might be made up of your subconscious mind and a momentary case of moosely poisoning occasioned by a fermenting raisin. Watch where you walk, Commander. Watch everywhere. And then it was gone. Vim stepped away from the mirror and turned around slowly. It must have been my face, he said to himself, otherwise it would have been the other way round, wouldn't it? He walked down the gangway into reality and what turned out to be Corporal Nobby Nobs, beyond whom reality does not get much more real. Good to see you. Mr. Vims. My word, you're looking fit. Your holiday must be doing you a lot of good. Got any bags? This was asked in the absolute certainty that Vims would have no bags, but a show of willing is always worth a try. Is everything all right? said Vims, ignoring this. Nobby scratched his nose and a bit fell off. Oh yes, thought Vims, I'm back. All right. Well, the usual stuff that happens is happening, but we're on top of it. Could I draw your attention to the hill over there? They were very careful not to harm the trees, and Lady Sybil herself promised a lingering death to anyone who upset the goblins. Mystified, Vim scanned the skyline and saw Hangman's Hill. Hell's Bells. It's a Clax Tower, it's a bloody Clax Tower. Sybil will go totally librarian about it. As a matter of fact, Mr. Vims, Lady Sybil was all for it by the time she'd read all of Captain Carrot's note. He said this was no time for you to be out of touch. You know that, sir, very persuasive officer, which is how come he got the Clax company to rush up here toot sweet with a temporary tower. Worked all night, so they did and got it lined up on the grand trunk sweet as a nut. This time Nobby picked his nose, briefly inspected the contents for interest or value, then flicked them away and went on, Only one thing, sir, the Ankh-Morpork Times wants to interview you about how you are a great hero what saved someone's wonderful fanny there was a pause while they waited for Feeney to stop choking with laughter and get his breath back and then Vims said, Corporal Nobby Nobs, this here is Chief Constable Upshot. I call him Chief Constable because he's the only law in these parts, that is until now. This is his patch, and so you will respect it, okay? Who else came with you from the smoke? Sergeant Detritus, Mr. Vims, but he's up at the hall, guarding her ladyship and young Sam with delicate surreptition. A part of Vims had unknowingly been holding its breath. Detritus and Willie Kins? Together they could face an army. He shook himself. But not Fred Colon. No, Mr. Vims, as I understand it we were on our way when the second Clax came through, but I reckon that he'll be here pretty soon. Gentlemen, I'm going home, said Vims, but, Mr. Feeney, how soon will another boat go down to Quirm? Feeney beamed. You're in luck, Commander. The Roberta E. Biscuit will be going tomorrow morning. Just the job for what I think you might want. Big and slow, but you won't mind that, because there's gambling and entertainment. Lots of tourists on it, but don't you worry, sir, your name is big on the river already. Trust me. Say the word and the captain of the biscuit will make certain that there's a king-size, I mean, sorry, commander-size stateroom for you, how about that? Vims opened his mouth to ask, is it expensive? 
and shut it again with the embarrassed realization that the Ramkin fortune could almost certainly buy every vessel on old treachery. Feeney, like the good copper he was becoming, noticed that slight moment of hesitation and said, Your money won't be good on the river, Commander, believe me. The savior of the fanny won't have to buy his own cigars or a stateroom anywhere along old treachery. Nobby Nobbs was almost bent double with laughter and managed to choke out, the fanny. Vim sighed. Nobby, her name was Francesca, fanny for short. Understand. It didn't work with some people, it only just did with Vim's. And, Nobby, I want you to wait here, and as soon as Fred's coach arrives you're in charge of getting him up to the goblin cave on the hill, okay? Yes, Mr. Vims, said Nobby, looking at his boots. And, Nobby, if you see a goblin who stinks like a latrine and glows slightly blue, well, that's a fellow copper and don't you forget it. Sybil was halfway down the lane as Vims quickly walked up it, and young Sam was running ahead and canonied into his father's legs, throwing his arms around them as best he could. Dad. I know how to milk a goat, Dad. You have to pull its tits, Dad, they're all wiggly. Vimsa's expression did not change as young Sam went on. And I'm learning to make cheese. And I have some badger POO now, and some weasel POO, too. My word, you have been busy, said Vims. Who told you the word tits, lad? Young Sam beamed. That was Willie the cowherd, Dad. Vims nodded. I'll have a little talk to you about that later, Sam, but first I think I'll have a word with Willie the cowherd. He lifted up young Sam, ignoring a twinge in his back. I hope that washing your hands played a part in these adventures. I take care of that, said Lady Sybil, catching up. Honestly, Sam. I let you out of my sight for hardly any time at all and here you are a hero, again. Really. Honestly, the whole river is talking about it. Fights on a river boat? Maritime chases? Oh dear me, I don't know where to put my face, so if you would be so kind as to let our child down carefully I'll press said face mightily to yours. When Vim surfaced for breath he growled. It is a real bloody clax tower, isn't it, yes? And now the times have got hold of all this they'll make out I'm some kind of hero, the damn fools. With the suction released, Lady Sybil said, No, Sam well maybe a little of that, but you would be amazed at how fast news travels along the river. Apparently you were standing on the wheelhouse roof of the wonderful Fanny fighting with a murderer and he shot a crossbow at you and it bounced off. I'm told there's going to be a large artist's impression in tomorrow's paper. Once again, I won't know where to put my face. And then Sybil couldn't contain herself anymore and burst out laughing. Frankly, Sam, you may have anything you want for dinner tonight. Vims leaned over and whispered, causing his wife to slap his hand and say, Later, perhaps. At this point, somewhat emboldened, Vims said, I couldn't help noticing that the bridge is severely damaged. Sybil nodded. Oh, yes dear, a terrible storm, wasn't it? It took away the entire central arch and all of the three disgraces. Thirty-one I remember them from my childhood. My mother used to put her hand over my eyes when we crossed the bridge and so I took a keen interest in them especially as one was scratching her bottom. Her smile brightened. But don't worry, Sam, naked ladies are not difficult to come by. Vims took comfort from her smile, and a tiny treacherous suspicion bubbled up once more. He thought he had stamped it down, but the damn thing kept coming back. And so he cleared his throat and said, Sybil, you did discuss plans for my holiday with veterinary, didn't you? Sybil looked surprised. Why yes, dear, of course. After all, he is technically your superior. 
Only technically, of course. I had a word with him on the subject at some charity do or other. I can't remember which right now as there are always so many. But there wasn't any difficulty. He said that it was high time you took a decent rest from your valiant activities. Vims was wise enough not to utter the words that entered his mouth, and instead said, carefully, E.R., so he didn't actually suggest that you came down to the shires. To be honest, Sam, it was quite some time ago, but we both have your best interests at heart, as you surely know. We generally discussed the matter and that's it, really. Vims left it at that. He would never know for sure. And anyway, the ball had dropped. Later, Samuel Vims, all of him, had a bath in the huge bathroom with his nose only just above the surface and came out feeling exactly the same man as before but at least a lot cleaner. The affidavits were in the strong room, and when the Ramkins design a strong room, it's not a room that you'll get into in a hurry. First you needed a combination, which opened a smaller but nevertheless dangerously efficient safe, simply to remove a key which then had to be inserted in locks hidden in three separate clocks in the hall and each key triggered a clockwork timing mechanism. Sybil told him that she had fond memories of her grandfather running split arse, as the old man called it, down the main hall to get the key into the last lock before the clock controlling the first lock had run down and certainly before the guillotines dropped. What we have we keep, Vims had thought as he tried it out. Well, they definitely meant it. Now, he dressed in clothes that didn't smell of fish. What next? It was nice to have a walk with young Sam again. Dad self-consciously out for a walk with his lad. Yes? That was the picture. Regrettably, this picture included a distant prospect of Sergeant Detritus, who was merging with the landscape, a feat that a troll officer can achieve by simply removing his armor and sticking a geranium behind his ear, whereupon he becomes, being of a rocky and stony persuasion, pretty much part of the landscape without even trying. Usually the troll officers wore supersized versions of the standard issue armor, because a lot of the power of a copper consists in looking like a copper. 32 safety considerations didn't matter, there were plenty of weapons which, if handled with skill, could go through steel armor, but all they would do to a naked troll was make him angry. Right now Detritus was failing to maintain a low profile. He was a bodyguard that was the truth of it, and he was also carrying his peacemaker which could, as it were, do what it said on the box. Some weapons are called a Saturday night special, Detritus's multi-arrow crossbow would last you all week. And somewhere, where Vims couldn't see him, which meant that nobody else could either, there was Willie Kins. There was your picture. Dad taking his lad for a walk in the presence of enough firepower to kill a platoon. Sybil had insisted, and that was that. Vim's himself being in danger was one thing, and Sybil had accepted that right from the start, but young Sam? Never. As they strolled up Hangman's Hill to see the new Clax Tower, Vim's told himself that Stratford would not use a bow. A bow was for expediency, but a killer now a killer would want to be up close, where he could see. Stratford had killed the goblin girl and had gone on killing her long after she was dead. He was a boy who liked his fun. He would want Vims to know who was killing him. Vims, Vims realized, knew killers too well for his own peace of mind. As they arrived on the hill they were met by a grinning knobby, who saluted with a variation on the theme of smartness but with some embarrassment, because he was not alone. A young goblin woman was sitting next to him. Nobby hastily tried to shoo her away and she, apparently with reluctance, retired to a minimum safe distance, still looking adoringly at the corporal. Despite everything, Vims tried to suppress the urge to smile, and managed to turn it into a stiff look. Fraternising with the natives, are you, Nobby? Young Sam wandered over to the goblin girl and took hold of her hand, 
which was something he tended to do to any female that he met for the first time, a habit which his father considered would quite possibly open doors for him in later life. The girl tried gently to pull her hand away, but young Sam was a ferocious holder. Nobby looked embarrassed. I ain't fraternizing with her, Mr. Vims, she wants to fraternize with me. She come out with the straw basket of little mushrooms and gives them to me, honestly. Are you sure they aren't poisonous? Nobby looked blank. Don't know, Mr. Vims. I ate them anyway, very nice, very crunchy, slightly nutty you might say, and Fred's here now, sir. This young lady and to Vimsa's surprise and approval Nobby did not put inverted commas around the word lady walked right up to him, took this weird shiny pot thing out of his hand, which was amazing because no one else could get it off of him, and there he was. Just like normal. Although I think we're going to have to remind him about washing, and crapping only in the privy and so on. Vims gave up. It was true that every organization had to have its backbone, and therefore it stood to reason that there also would have to be some person who equated to the bits usually destined for dog food. But Nobby was loyal and lucky, and if there is anything that a policeman really needs, it's luck. Maybe Nobby had got lucky. What are you doing up here, Nobby, he said. Nobby looked at Vims as if he was mad and pointed to the wobbling temporary Clax tower. Have to check the Clax messages, Mr. Vims. Actually, young Tony, who is the only one manning it, he sort of types them, and wraps them around a stone and they drops down, which is there was a rattle on Nobby's helmet and he deftly caught a stone wrapped in a strip of paper before it hit the ground. Which is why I stand just here, Mr. Vims. Nobby unrolled the paper and announced, one double state room and one single on the Roberta E. Biscuit, departing at 9 p.m. Tomorrow. Lucky you, Mr. Vims. Clax. What would we do without it, Et. There was a shout from above. Stand back, man coming down and Vim saw the whole structure of the Clax Tower tremble as the young man carefully lowered himself from one spar to another, testing every one before putting his weight on it. He dropped the last few feet and held out his hand to Vim's. Pleased to meet you, Sir Samuel. Sorry it's shaky, but we were still working on it last night. A real rush job. Needs must when Lord Veterinary drives, you might say. We'll do it properly later if that's okay by you. I've got it lined up on a grand trunk tower, and they'll bounce it to anywhere you want, plus a feed down to a clax on your house, too. Of course you'll have to have somebody manning this one to maintain the link, but from what I see that won't be a problem. The young man saluted Vims and added, Best of luck to you, sir, and now I'm off to have my meal and a wash. There was another clang on the helmet of Nobby Knobs, and a wad of paper wrapped around a pebble fell at his feet. The young claxman picked it up proprietorially and read the message. Oh, it's just an acknowledgement of service closure, confirming that I am standing down for a break. My assistant typed it. He didn't really need to pass it on, but he is a conscientious little bugger and I have never seen such a quick study. Show him how to do something once and that's enough. Reliable little devil as well. And with those big hands he has no problem with the keyboard. As the man strode off whistling down the hill, Vims jumped to a conclusion like a grasshopper. Stinky. Just you come down here, you little perisher, he yelled. Right here, Commander. The little goblin was already standing almost between Vimsa's boots. You. You. You operating a clax? Can you read? Stinky held out both large hands. No, but can look, but can remember. Green man say, Stinky, this pointy thing it called A and Stinky don't need telling twice, and he say, this one, look like bum, he called B. 
good fun. The cracked voice wheedled, but in a way that seemed to Vims to be full of cynical knowingness. The goblin is useful, goblin is trustworthy, goblin is helpful. Goblin isn't dead. And it seemed to Vims that he was the only one hearing these words. Young Sam had shuffled up to hold Stinky's hand, but had thought better of it. Under his breath, Sam Vims said, What are you, Stinky? What are you, Sam Vims? Stinky grinned. Hang, Sam Vims. Hang together or hang separately. Above all, hang on. Hang, Mr. Vims. Vims sighed. I think it's quite likely that I might, he said gloomily. He looked around to find himself pinned in the gazes of young Sam, Nobby Nobs, and the goblin girl who had been looking at Nobby as if the little corporal was an Adonis. Embarrassed, he shrugged, and said, just a passing thought. Asterisk however you put it, Fred Colin was one of Vim's oldest friends and it was sobering to think that so was Nobby Nobs. Vims found the sergeant halfway down the goblin cave looking strangely pink, amused, but nevertheless quite cheerful, possibly because he was eating a roasted rabbit like there was no tomorrow which clearly had been the case for the rabbit. Cheery was watching him with some care from a distance, and when she saw Vims gave him a smile and a thumbs up sign, which was reassuring. Fred Colin tried to salute, but had to think about it for a moment. Sorry about this, Mr. Vims, had some kind of nasty turn. All a bit vague, really, and suddenly here I am among these people. Vims held his breath and Colin continued, very nice, very helpful, very generous, too. They've been giving me all kinds of mushrooms, extremely tasty. Not very well versed in the trouser department, but I speak as I find. Makes a man think, I ain't sure what, but it does. He looked around with a strange fluorescence in his eyes. Nice in here, isn't it? Nice and calm away from the maddening crowd. Wouldn't mind staying here for a bit. Nice. Sergeant Colin stopped, flung the rabbit bones over his shoulder and reached down quickly into the mess of stones beside him. He picked one up. Was it Vimsa's imagination or did it twinkle for a moment as it once again turned into just a stone? Stay as long as you like, Fred, said Vims. I've got to go, but Nobby'll be around, and just about everybody else from the watch or so it seems. Stay as long as you like he glanced at Cheery Little Bottom but perhaps not too long. More thoughts passed as young Sam's daily stroll progressed back down the hill and through the village and when Jiminy appeared at the doorway of the pub and gave Vims a little nod that spoke volumes, Vims's passing thought was that an astute publican knows which way the wind is blowing and adjusts his sails accordingly. No one knew better than he that no one knows where rumors come from and how they are spread, but the little convoy, even though it included Nobby Nobs and the Goblin Girl, got smiles and nods where a week ago there would have been blank stares. Because the dreadful truth is that nobody wants to support the losing side. When they reached Ramkin Hall again Vims found Sybil in the Rose Garden, apparently deadheading, something that had to be done because it was on the list of things you had to do in the country whether you liked to do it or not. She glanced up at her husband and then got on with what she was doing, and said quietly, You've been worrying people, haven't you, Sam? Lady Rust popped in unexpectedly for a social visit, right after you left. Snib. Snib. Went the secateur, furiously. Did you let her in? Snib. Snib. Of course. Of course. There was another snip. Snib. And I gave her tea and chocolate macaroons, too. She may be an ignorant way-faced bitch who gives herself a title that is not rightfully hers, but there is such a thing as manners, when all is said and done. Snib. Snib. Snap. I only did that because that one rather spoils the symmetry, honestly. 
Anyway, I had a lecture about maintaining standards, and banding together in defense of our culture, you know the sort of thing, it's always just a code. Lady Sybil leaned back with her secateur poised, and regarded the rose bushes like a bloody-handed revolutionary looking for his next aristocrat. Do you know what the bitch said? She said, my dear, who cares what happens to a few trolls? Let them take drugs if they want to, that's what I say. Eyes ablaze, Sybil continued, and so I thought about Sergeant Detritus and how often he's saved your life, and then there was young Brick, that troll lad he adopted. And it made me so angry that I nearly said something unrepeatable. They think that I'm like them. I hate that. They just don't get it. They've got on well for years without ever having to think differently, and now they don't know how. Snib. Snib. Crack. You've just killed a rosebush, dear, said Vims, impressed. It took a pretty good grip to push those blades through an inch of what looked like a small tree. It was a briar, Sam, wouldn't ever do any good. You could have given it a chance, perhaps. Sam Vims, you treasure your ignorance of gardening, so don't start weaving a social hypothesis in front of an angry woman holding a blade. There is a difference between plants and people. Do you think her husband sent her? Vims said, standing back a little. He is in the frame, you know, and I expect by the end of the day to be able to link him to smuggling trafficking in goblins and certainly attempting to send Jethro Jefferson abroad to get him out of the way. I know what happens to the goblins taken to Howanda land and it's not good for their health. Jefferson told me that Rust was behind the eviction of the local goblins three years ago. I'm hoping to get confirmation of this very shortly. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.